conclusions, the final section in your experimental practical report, and the top five reasons why students get them wrong. At this point of your practical report, you should have covered things like the important concepts that are relevant to understand what you're going to do, the experimental design that you have, uh, the results that you have obtained, the analysis that you've done, the discussion that is involved. Now is a point to write your conclusion. Piece of cake. We write these all the time in English. We also write them in history. Couldn't be easier. Yeah, but you'd be wrong. When you want to make a good impression, you need to start off strong and you need to finish strong. But unfortunately, students don't always finish their practical reports strongly. Conclusions tend to be one of the weakest parts of their paper, and it shouldn't have to be a problem because it's so simple. Let's break it down. Okay, now you might be thinking to yourself, Mr. Bowman, what should a conclusion actually have then? It's quite simple. The first thing you need to keep in mind that it's supposed to be a summary of your experiment. This will be things like, what did you try to do? What were your thoughts going into the experiment? What did you find? What were the results that you had? And a concluding statement about the whole thing. Let's go into each one of those in more detail. First one is, what were you trying to do? This is just your aim. Restate it. The reason why we restate them is because you need to imagine the mindset of somebody who's going to read your paper. They aren't just going to read from front to back. Do you ever do that sometimes when you pick up a book? Sometimes. Or sometimes you're going to skip ahead just to see what it's like. In that case, people might be picking up stacks of practical reports, and only some of them might be interesting to them. So what they will do is they'll pick up your paper, they'll have a look, okay, the title, okay, that kind of looks interesting. I'll flip over to the back and see what they found. So they jump straight to your conclusion, but they'll have no idea about anything you say unless you tell them. You have to restate a few things to summarize it, what the entire paper is about. So you need to restate the aim, what you're trying to do. Next, you need to tell me what, the, what your uh, thoughts were going into the experiment. This is going to be restating your hypothesis or expected outcomes. Now, this will depend on what kind of experimental design that you have. Some experiments lend themselves to a cause and, ef and effect um, investigation, such as, as I increase temperature, does the pH also increase or does it decrease? That's a cause and effect experimental investigation. Some experiments don't have anything like that. There'll be things like merely just quantifying things or measuring stuff, such as, what chemical is this? It's this. Good. There's no real hypothesis involved. It might be things like, how much caffeine is there in one can of Red Bull? Is it the same as what it says on the label? That doesn't have a hypothesis. So in that case, you, would, you could probably write something about your expected outcomes for that experiment. Next, what were the results? You need to select specific data that summarize the, the findings that you have. If you aren't quoting any numbers or observations, then you're totally doing it wrong. Next one, concluding statement. This is the part where you state whether your results are supporting uh, your hypothesis or negating your hypothesis. However, there are some cases where the results don't clearly indicate either way. In that case, you could say the results are inconclusive. If your experiment doesn't have a hypothesis, but instead an objective, such as what chemical is this, or how much caffeine in this can of Red Bull, then you will have to write a statement based upon what you have. And I have a couple of examples like this, so you can have a look at what I've written about, and maybe that might give you ideas on what you can write about in those sorts of situations. All right, let's jump into it. My first example is one that I wrote for my year eights in terms of bounce efficiency of a tennis ball. Let's look at an example of a practical report which does involve a hypothesis. So my first example here is the bounce efficiency of tennis balls. This is a whole practical report example. You can have a look and, and um, see how it's been laid out and the referencing that I've used. Uh, you can find it on my website called anglesandacid.com. There's a whole bunch of resources there on not only just content and concepts like you know pH and things like this, it also has how to write your assignments better and other resources to go along with it. So if you look at the bottom of this uh, practical report, this is for uh, my grade 8 science class, I've written a conclusion down here, and I'm going to break it down. 
The aim of, her, of the investigation, that's the first one there. I'm summarizing and restating my aim already from the start. The aim of the investigation was to determine the bounce efficiency of a tennis ball at varying heights, and it was hypothesized that as the drop height increased, so too will the bounce height due to extra gravitational potential energy being added with an increase in drop height. So notice how I've restated the aim, and I've also restated the hypothesis. Now let's move on. The findings indicated subtle changes occur in the bounce efficiency of the tennis ball, ranging from 37.3% to 32.9%, but with an overall decline in the chosen trend line. Okay, notice how in this part, I'm summarizing the findings that I had found. Summarize specific data, the 32.9%, and I'm also mentioning the overall trend lines. This is important. Moving on. The results of the experiment support the hypothesis that as the drop height increases, so too will the bounce height due to an increase in gravitational potential energy. However, the bounce efficiency remained relatively constant. So in this part, I'm making my concluding statement. I'm stating whether my hypothesis was supported or negated. This one could be a little bit better if, I'm, if I supported the statements that the drop height increases, so does the bounce height. I could have found some specific data to show this. However, I was probably intending to use the bounce, uh, bounce efficiency numbers to provide evidence for my statement. And I've also gone further to make other statements about the bounce efficiency, which isn't the primary focus of the hypothesis statement. I just expected that if I drop it from a higher height, it should bounce a little bit higher. But the investigation was trying to figure out, okay, well, how, do, how does the uh, bounce efficiency change uh, with um, changes of drop height? So I've made a little concluding statement about that as well. Not so bad. Let's move on to a second example. Okay, let's look at an example where there is no hypothesis being involved. You are simply investigating perhaps a quantity of something. It depends. So in this case, I was doing an experiment with my class determining the concentration of ammonia in cloudy ammonia. So ammonia is a, uh, a molecule, uh, usually a gas, but it can be dissolved in water. And cloudy ammonia is a cleaning product. You find it, you buy it in bottles at the supermarket. So we were doing a bunch of chemistry uh, uh, to uh, extract the ammonia and then measure it. So if you can scroll down to the bottom, so again, this is another full worked ex practical report example. Uh, this one was aimed for my year 11 chemistry students. So it's much more detailed. There's a lot more calculations involved. So if you're doing senior chemistry or senior science, maybe this is something you might want to look into as an example for your work. So here's my conclusion. The aim of the investigation was to verify the 20 grams per liter of uh, ammonia claim on the label of cloudy ammonia. The experimental results determined 20.6 liters grams per liter contents with an uncertainty of 2.604%, which differed by a margin of 3% from the claim. This minor difference from ammonia content provides evidence of the authenticity of the claim as well as some indication of the tolerances of the product's manufacturing. So sounds a bit uh, full of words, but let's just examine those main points that we have in our conclusions. First one, summarize the aim and the hypothesis. Do I have the aim here? Yes, I do. The aim of the investigation was to verify the 20 grams per liter claim on the bottle. Second, do I summarize my findings? The experimental results determined in 20.6 grams per liter content with an uncertainty of 2.604%. So I'm summarizing my findings. I'm also including, uh, if, if I've got a benchmark to measure against, I'm also including some, uh, some margin of error. How far off was my answer, the experimental results uh, from the uh, label, the claim? So we got almost the whole thing. Now the last bit is, a concluding statement. Now, in this case, there is no hypothesis. I wasn't testing. Um, as this increases, this will decrease. I'm not doing a cause and effect style of experiment. I'm me merely just measuring the content of something. So this is what I chose to write about. The minor difference in ammonia content provides evidence of the authenticity. So the label on the packet is legit, as well as the margin of error the 3% difference between the experimental result and the true the claim result, it gives you a bit of information about what kind of tolerance they have when they manufacture these products. 
So that's something that I could write about in my conclusion. Maybe you want to write something similar. And now for the great finale, the top five reasons why students get their conclusions so wrong. Let's start for number five. Number five, students tend to write their conclusions which are not very insightful. They'll tend to say things like, and so the experiment was successful, which is not very helpful. Number four, they tend to not summarize their findings. They don't give me any, any information as to what you actually found. Not very uh, strong conclusion at all. Number three, they tend, to they tend to forget to restate their aim and their hypothesis. Like I mentioned before, when people pick up your paper, they're not going to read the whole thing from start to finish every time. In fact, they're just most likely going to pick it up, look at your title and the first few sentences of your introduction, then skip to the end and read the conclusion to see if it's what they were looking yeah, see if this prac report is what they were looking for. So they're not going to understand what you're saying unless you restate the aim and you restate your hypothesis. Refresh their memory if they are reading your paper from start to finish as well. Number two, misusing the word proven. You can't use the word proven. And I'll tell you why. To prove something in science, you need to test it very well. And when you do this, you need to test it a number of times, many, many times, to make sure that your result or, it, or your data is not just a fluke. And also, not only do you have to repeat it numerous times, it also has to be tested by other scientists around the world, different times, different approaches, to make sure that your idea is in fact true. This is going to be way beyond the scope of a, science, of a high school science experiment. So you're not in a position to say that you have definitive proof that your idea is true. So you can't use the word proof. You can only say that the evidence indicates this or indicates that. It supports this or it negates that. You can't say proof. And number one, the most common mistake that all students tend to make is that they don't refer back to specific data that backs up their conclusion. It's such an important part of it. You need to say, all right, uh, the bounce efficiency remains roughly constant. You can't make that conclusion unless you say specific numbers that indicate that you're, what you're saying is true. You need to show me specific numbers. And if you refer back to the examples we just had before, you can see how I've done that in the examples. All right, that's it. I hope this helps. This is the final bit in the Writing Better Science series. Uh, if you haven't checked them out already, I've written one on writing a better introduction, uh, writing a better method, and soon there will be some material on writing a better um, da uh, results section and a better um, discussion section. But I haven't written them up just yet, but they should be there in the next few months. All right, I hope this helps. Hope you liked it. Don't forget to check other parts of my Angles and Acid website. There are practical report examples, there are uh, tips on how to use Excel, how to make tables in Excel, how to make graphs in Excel. There's a little um, a link to a website which allows you to build um, a, uh, a apparatus diagram so you don't have to draw them by scratch. Uh, and there's lots of other things that you can check out. So I encourage you to do so. See you later. It's so simple. I'll break it down for you. The first thing you need to keep in mind is that it's supposed to summarize 